All right, so after some technical difficulties, we are actually live with Joe Duffy. Hi, Joe. Hello. How's it going? Awesome, how are you? Good. Uh, okay, so this is on .NET, a weekly chat with the .NET team and guests, and today our guest is Joe Duffy, as you can see. Uh, I, I'm very happy to have uh, Joe on the show uh, to talk probably among other things about, about Midori, but probably mostly Midori. Um, so, Joe, how, how long have you been with Microsoft? I've actually been at Microsoft for 12 years now. Great. Uh, so, Joe has been uh, uh, at the origin of, of uh, some interesting features in C Sharp, and he's been working uh, for a few years on a secret project at Microsoft uh, called Midori. Um, and now, uh, Joe is working uh, on, the, on the .NET team. Um, is that an accurate? Yeah. Uh, Fairly okay. accurate. I actually joined, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, background for me. I joined mm -hmm. 12 years ago. I joined actually the CLR team. It was right around the time of 1.1 uh, shipping uh, and then 2.0. Uh, um, and then I, I basically sp spent several years on the .NET team. Then I went and worked on uh, sort of a small project that turned into the, the .NET tasks feature and then await. Uh, parallel link and a lot of the concurrency features in .NET that shipped. I guess it would have been 3.0 uh, at the time. Uh, and I started working on concurrency. It was interesting. It was a hard problem. It was right around the time of multi-core, many-core. People thought, hey, your average you know, PC you would have 128 cores or something crazy like that. It didn't quite work out that way. But, um, but I eventually, you know, concurrency is difficult. And a lot of programmers get it get it wrong, yeah, the, the tools aren't great for getting it right, you know, there's race conditions and deadlocks, and I actually ended up writing a book around that same time. Um, and then I decided basically, hey, there's no way to actually solve the race condition and safety problem without really attacking the core of the system. And so that's, I had a friend, Chris Brum, uh, who I stayed in touch with throughout the years, who I worked with on, on the CLR team, and he had started this project called Midori, and you know, they were willing to totally upend the whole thing and start from scratch and kind of revisit some of these more fundamental problems uh, from the core of the operating system itself, which is basically what I felt was necessary uh, to really tackle the safe concurrency problem. And so that led me kind of into incubation land for, for a number of years, um, which was a lot of fun. But now, you know, I'm back to shipping products and trying to take some of the lessons we learned in Midori and actually apply them to C++ C sharp and .NET. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. You, you you just said that you, you your thinking at the time was that uh, correctly implementing concurrency uh, required some very deep. Um, required actually to go as deep as the operating system. Uh, do you do you think that's the other case, or uh, when you say that we are applying some of those lessons to .NET, how far can we go applying those lessons? Well, I think we, you don't. Uh, I think technically speaking, you can get some level of safety without actually changing the operating system. I think if you look at Rust is probably the most inspiring example of doing this today. Um, mm. It's a language, it you know, runs on standard operating systems, and it does give you safe concurrency. Uh, I felt like architecturally, having things you know, more like what Erlang does, you know, fine-grained message passing, and really architecting the system from that at the very core, and then ensuring that the entire system, not just those who opted into safe concurrency, but the entire system from the bottom up um, was built safely. And, and actually, I kind of take it for granted, but most operating systems are still written in C. Uh, Windows and Linux are, are still written in C. So actually having a type and memory safe operating system from the bottom up actually enables kind of a level of safety you wouldn't get if, say, you know, one programming language happened to be safe and some of the programs in the operating system happened to use that language. In terms of .NET, how far we can take it, it really is difficult to retrofit this after the fact. I think a number of the things that we did in Midori will have practical applications and practical benefits uh, around performance and reliability and safety, but really to get that guarantee um, the whole system needs to be hardened and written this way. And so 
I think most programmers will practically benefit from it. So it may seem a little theoretical, you know, whether the entire system is written that way or not. But in terms of really having that belts and suspenders safety, security, um, that that's to me still an open problem for the entire industry. Mm. Um, one of the things I, I, I was wondering about the Midori project is, um, I mean, as developers, we all um, we all delete a lot of code. Uh, that is that is part of the job. Uh, but um, and and that that may be a, a very personal question. But um, how did you deal with uh, stopping working on on that project? And uh, how did you deal with uh, what what must amount to deleting? hundreds of millions of lines of code or something like that. <laughs> not quite that much, but it was a lot of code. Um, I still have it on my workstation, so it's not been deleted. Uh, um, I still go back to it from time to time as I'm writing these blog posts just to kind of you know remind myself of some of the features and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, I really encourage uh, everyone to read your, your blog series about Midori. It's, it's really very interesting. It's a very long read. Uh, but it's 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 worth the time. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, incubation projects kind of work that way. You you know that's the whole idea is you don't really know where you're going from the beginning. You want to explore an area, you want to take those lessons, and then you want to apply them to to a product. And sometimes the incubation effort quote graduates into a, an actual shipping product, and sometimes. Sometimes it just evaporates. You, you call it quits. You say, hey, this is an interesting experiment. Hopefully, you wrote down your, the lessons you learned, and then you move on completely, and there's no lasting artifacts. I think Midori is somewhere in the middle, mm. uh, and that's, that's actually why I'm writing these blog entries. I, I have a, a good friend, Jim Laris, who used to work at uh, Microsoft Research, and he would, he would get on my case all the time about the fact that we weren't publishing papers regularly. And, I mean, we did publish a paper in Uppsala a few years back, but <clears throat> we probably didn't do as much as we should have had we known at the outset how the project would have would have you know ended. Um, and so now that's that's actually one of the reasons I'm writing the blog post is try to transfer some of that knowledge because we did try a lot of experiments, we did try a lot of things that, in my mind, are inevitable for the industry in the future. And so to not share that knowledge and take that you know with me to my grave or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, and, uh, so, some of uh, you said that that some of that was inevitable, and actually, it's already happening, right? You, you see a lot of the ideas that that you um, that you put into Midori actually appearing on on other platforms, right? Right, and you know, I think it's um, a lot of these ideas existed way long before us. I think we actually one of the novel things that we did is we kind of took a look at all this interesting research that had happened that hadn't quite made it into mainstream operating systems and then tried to adopt them and put them together to see what happens. And I think a good, great example of that, um, I was going back over some old you know, uh, presentations and papers and Butler Lampson had talked about predictions he had made for computer science in general. And you know, a lot of his work on you know, fault tolerance and, and systems design and the PC, Alto PC, really did have a huge impact on the industry. And he said, well, one thing I got wrong was capability-based security. And it turns out, I don't think he got that wrong because it's a bad idea. It's actually just very difficult. And it's very different from the way security works in kind of an actual based system, um, ambient authority, like you have in Unix. And so we took that idea that had been around for, you know, since the 70s and really applied it in a very kind of principled way to see where it took us. And there were a number of those things that we did, and you, it's kind of a magical combination of type safety, you know, uh, concurrency safety, capability-based security. A lot of these things that you you just can't do unless you design the system from from the outset. Yeah, because and when when you do have all these capabilities, all all these features, they actually click together and, and form a whole that is much greater than its parts, right? That's exactly right. Without type safety, you can't. And memory safety, you really can't depend on an object reference being unforgeable, and therefore you probably can't depend on it for security. Um, and it's a little controversial, I would say, depending on type and memory safety for security features, uh, because a bug in your compiler is now a 
know, part of your trusted computing base and could be a security vulnerability. Um, so that was another contentious topic. So uh, th there is a, this word unforgeable that that you've been using quite a lot in the in the blog series, and uh, uh, it wasn't entirely entirely clear to me when I when I was reading it what that exactly meant. W mm -hmm. What is uh, an unforgeable object or an unforgeable token? An unforgeable token, I mean, in 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 the most general sense, is a token that. Uh, third party or an observer could not manufacture out of thin air, right? So somebody couldn't forge, you know, like a signature, you know, somebody couldn't forge that on your behalf. Uh, the only way to have one is to be granted that token and then to, you know, hand it out to other, other parties. So for example, an object reference in a type and memory safe system is unforgeable because you can't just create an object reference out of some random address or integer. You have to be given that reference either from the garbage collector or through traversing a series of pointers uh, in the garbage collected object space. So you can't just say new object reference, pass an integer like you can in C or C++ and then cast it to um, you know, an object reference. So because of that, you can actually depend on, hey, if you have a file system object reference, you must have been given that from someone. And so we can trust that you have access to that because the point of granting you access to that object token is where you would enforce ACLs and so on. Right, but eventually uh, that, that, that file system object must have been created somewhere. So where does the authority come from to, uh, to um, ultimately create that, that file system object? Right, and that, that's what we call the application model. It's essentially every application would declare the set of capabilities that it demanded, and then it would be policy that a user would, you know, configure the system and install the application, similar to what, you know, you have on your phone today. Mm. Hey, this application wants to access the internet or wants to access your contacts or what have you. So in Android, there's a thing called capabilities, but it's not the same thing I'm talking about. That version of capabilities is ambient authority still. It's the notion that any code in that application can access that capability. In the Midori model, you would say, hey, I need to access, access your contacts. And then the entry point of the application would get something like an address, address book object. And so the system enforces that policy, gives you the address book object. And then from there, it's up to you who you share that address book with. It really is objects were the way of encapsulating access control uh, to privileged and sensitive information. Okay, so potentially once you get uh, a reference to one of those privileged ob objects, you could pass it around to other. That's right. Okay. That's right. So you really did have to be thoughtful about, hey, you know, I'm sharing this object to, you know, with you. And just like any other object, if I give you access to the object, you can. Yeah. What you, you get delegated some of the privileges of, yeah. Right. Okay. But it was intense. It really taking object orientation to a fairly extreme level. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the way it's uh, implemented by uh, just, just having those objects passed in uh, as uh, constructor parameters, this, this looks very, very much like uh, 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 Dependency injection. Right. Uh, it essentially was dependency injection. The only, it was actually a, a thing that we were on the fence about was whether to do real dependency injection. Um, you know, if you, if a program gets access to a capability, well, what if some leaf node component wants to access that? Well, in our system, you actually had to configure those, those capabilities and pass them around. Uh, dependency injection would let you kind of bypass some of that manual passing of capabilities, but then it's a little bit of magic. And when it comes to security, oh, I see. In, 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 in yeah. the case of Midori, it's very explicit. That's right. Yeah. Now that we were always going backwards and forwards, and I think another thing with Midori, I, you know, we were still working a lot of, on a lot of these ideas. I think the usability of a lot of the features that was probably the main. Uh, facet that we were still hard at work on uh, when we decided to transition the project uh, into Windows and, and DevDiv. Uh, we have a question from the audience. 
uh, Jose is, is asking uh, if uh, applying the lessons of Midori is easier on .NET Core or, or does it apply just as well on .NET Framework? Um, because there is less baggage in a way in .NET Core? Definitely easier <clears throat> um, because there's less baggage. Now I think in general, it's a hotly debated topic on the team, what level of compatibility we want between desktop, .NET, .NET Core, and .NET RT, you know, or, or Core RT. I mean, that, that is still a hotly debated topic. So depending on how radical we're willing to be, we might be able to adopt more of it. My, my favorite example is slices. Um, Go has slices. I love it. I wish we could have done that. From If we could rewind the clock, that's probably one of the few things I... I would really, you know, uh, be adamant about adopting a .NET one is the idea that a, an array syntactically can refer to a subarray um, without having to copy or allocate. Mm. I think that's very powerful. I think one of the key things when we were doing Midori is we found standard .NET code just allocates like crazy, you know, byte arrays and copy from this byte array to that byte array because the size wasn't quite right. So that one, I'm hoping we can get into .NET um, in some fashion. The problem with slices is if it's additive, then people, you know, like you could come up with a new type called slice of T, which we actually have a prototype in in the CoreFX Labs uh, repo on GitHub. But now somebody has, you know, to write it with an array syntax, and then they have to learn that that wasn't the right thing to do, and then they have to go back and change their code. So you never reach that ubiquity that you get if the slice syntax mm -hmm. is just gives you the right thing. Yeah, in, basically everywhere you can use an array, you can use a slice. It doesn't, it, it that's always right. works. But that, that does break compatibility with desktop uh, code. And so that's a hotly debated topic. I don't know where we're going to land on that one. Uh, I think it's very important, but so is compatibility. So that, that's an example of the kind of struggle that we face when we're trying to bring some of these concepts back. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Julien this time. Uh, and it's about debugging, and I also have some questions about debugging. I'm, I'm very curious about uh, how debugging works with uh, uh, asynchronous, the high degree of synchronicity that, that happens in Midori. But his question is, how do capabilities affect the debugging experience? Wouldn't the debugger need a backdoor to bypass the encapsulation and access all objects? Generally, no. Um, we basically, just like any other object evaluation or object expression evaluation, you would find access to the capability, usually at the entry point of your program, and then you would be able to access anything that your program could access. So actually, capabilities weren't, capabilities of anything helped with debugging because rather than having, you know, imagine if you end up trying a file system operation and it fails for some reason. And then you have to debug, hey, why did it fail? I guess, you know, in a classical system, you know, in, in Unix or Windows, you'd have to find out, oh, I didn't have the right authority set. Maybe I wasn't impersonating the right account and, and all this stuff. I mean, that's actually difficult. You'd have to, you know, look at object ACLs in the, in the file system. Whereas in our system, you would see, oh, in fact, you, often you couldn't even write the, the illegal code because you either you have access to the object or you don't. And so if you didn't have ac access to read from the file system, you just wouldn't even get a file system object. And so that, that actually helped debugging quite a bit. OK. Then you, you mentioned async debugging. Yeah, so yeah because uh, in my experience, and I, I, I guess in everybody's experience with uh, debugging asynchronous uh, code, uh, it, it's very hard to follow stack traces. Sometimes your stack traces are completely meaning, meaningless, uh, especially with callback type uh, models of, of asynchrony. Yeah, so we, I, I went over this a little bit in our in my async blog post. We actually started with all callbacks, um, very Node.js like, um, and as you can imagine. Writing uh, an entire operating system in callbacks was a little maddening, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it it, it worked uh, to a degree, but it, it just couldn't scale beyond a certain point. I mean, once you started writing very complicated asynchronous logic like we had in the heart of our file system or our networking stack, it was just very difficult to debug, very difficult to understand, 
Uh, you end up with weird code duplication patterns because you can't use standard control flow constructs. So we we actually um, started doing await kind of before the C sharp team did, and this was around the time F sharp was working on async workflows. There was this language that I had actually worked on. Uh, well, not not directly, but I was in the same group that was working on Axum A X U M. It was this language that was doing message passing, but and this uh, colleague of mine, Nicholas Gustafsson, had come up with this await thing, which was kind of what became eventually await in C sharp. So we started partnering uh, on some of that and sharing some code and helping the C sharp team uh, on some of the perf optimizations that we had done, and that radically improved the, the debugging because now you have stack traces. And we eventually did first class support for this with link stacks instead of these, um, you know, state machines that the C sharp compiler generates in the front end. We actually built link stacks into the operating system itself. And so the code for uh, async and await actually just compiled down to normal looking sequential code. It just ran on these lightweight coroutines with link stacks. So that, that was huge for debugging. Now that still left the problem of message passing we had message passing all over the system. There's so many processes. I think our browser was 18 processes uh, for the main program, and then you know for every tab there's a separate process. So like debugging that started becoming the pain point. And for that, we eventually did causality uh, across processes and added the notion what we called structured concurrency. So if you if you sent some messages and then waited for responses, we could actually make that look like a stack trace in the debugger that extended across multiple processes. And so you could actually break into a process and see actually the message that came in oh. that triggered the execution. You could actually then click on the, in the debugger, you could click on the different frames and it would actually take you to the right process. And so you could like, oh, oh that was, that was pretty game changing actually. Yeah, I, I can imagine how it would. Uh, is it is it something that's applicable actually to .NET, for example, or, or is it too tied into the, the OS? No, it definitely is applicable. Uh, I think the the challenge with .NET is um, there's no standard message passing framework, right? I mean, we have a few actor frameworks. Mm. Um, we had we we had Aaron Stanard last week on the show to talk about Aka.NET. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so if we picked, you know, one of them, like Akka.net or, you know, um, or Leans or some, some of these others, if we kind of blessed that and said, hey, this is the right way to do things, then sure, I mean, Visual Studio could have great debugging support. We already have in some places, we have execution context and a few places where causality does flow through the system. Um, I think with, uh, with Core CLR, that matters a lot less because you don't do, you know, cross app domain calls and that sort of thing. But um, we have a lot of the hooks, so we could do that if we wanted. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, being on the .NET team, I, I, I can see uh, some of the some of those ideas uh, being applied. Uh, what about Windows? Uh, how much of what you learned about about the the OS actually made its way into Windows? Well, we. As we were developing Midori, um, we used to do this every year. We'd do kind of a road show with people within the company. And then eventually we'd go and meet with Steve Ballmer. And I always had the distinct pleasure of presenting to Steve, which was quite nerve wracking. But, uh, but leading up to that was great because we'd, we'd talk with people around the company. And Windows was actually one of the, you know, my favorites because we had deep technical engagement. It was an opportunity to share some lessons learned, and especially, you know, some of the work that went into you know, adding capabilities for mobile and doing better resource management. Um, and frankly, these days, a bunch of the Midori folks are actually on the Wavefront um, group uh, within the Edge team. So they're actually helping to apply some of the UI and browser lessons we learned. Um, and now, you know, I'm actually one of the big initiatives I'm working on is helping to get a more safer style of C++ actually into the heart of Windows and working very closely with the Windows team on that. So 
you know, it's, it's hard to see. It's not like we uh, overnight suddenly we shipped a new operating system, but there are definitely dozens of influences I can point to that have actually, you know, qualitatively made the system better over time. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the other people who were on the Midori team? Uh, you, you, you mentioned some of them in the in the blog posts, but uh, uh, I, I think it, it, there were some pretty impressive people working on this. Uh. Yeah, I I think it you know that's the thing I miss the most actually, not the technology, not um, the specific project or anything like. It's really the group of people. It was a very self-selected group of very senior people. I was you know when I joined, I was a principal engineer, and I was probably like one of the five most junior people on the entire team. Um, so that was great. I mean, I learned a ton from the people. I learned from, you know, the people that were running the project. It was it was, it was a great time. I, I actually, a bunch of the people that worked there, actually you worked at Xerox Park, um, you know, back in the 80s, and they kind of likened it to back then where it felt like, you know, building something big and huge. and. Ironically, I guess, kind of like Xerox Park, I don't think the company really knew what to do with the technology we built. Um, so like Xerox Park, you know, uh, I don't think we knew what to do with the technology we built, to be, to be honest. Um, so there were a lot of similarities there, but it's a, I talked to one friend of mine who um, unfortunately left the, the company, um, but he's told me it's hard to work on any project now because he's pretty convinced that nothing will ever compare to the, the, the magnitude and just the the amount of learning and, and, and fun that we had. So, so yeah, it's great. But I stay in touch with most of the people. I think um, that's actually one of the things, you know, I, I hate that I'm the one writing the blog post because um, the team at its peak was, you know, 110, 120 people, something like that. And there were so many people that, that did amazing work on the project. And so I feel like they should get some of the credit. And it was unfortunate when the project was going on, how secretive it was. There was this taboo around the project. And, and so a lot of the people that worked on it have gotten no recognition, which is, which is really unfortunate. I'd like to do like a roll call or something someday and just highlight some of the folks that have done that. Mm. Do, you, do you think things would, would be much different if something like Midori was starting in today's Microsoft that is much more open? I do, actually. I think, you know, it's easy to say, but back at the time, it would have been unheard of. But I, for me, the biggest thing that would have changed is if we did it open source from from the start. Because I think, you know, um, at least then, it, it probably would have been less threatening as well. I think at some point, um, it seemed like we, you know, people thought we wanted to replace Windows completely. Mm. So there became this weird competitive tension. I think if it was open source, it would have been more of a kind of innocuous research project that people could, you know, learn from and participate in. And then if it did really find a way into production, uh, I think people would have accepted it more because it would have been a more gradual thing that people watched in the open rather than suddenly one day this new operating system comes out. It seems like much more of an event then. Um, where would you say Midori fits in the uh, family tree of operating systems. Uh, I mean, the, it, it almost seems today like like you have Windows and uh, Unix derived or Linux even Linux derived operating systems and not much else. Uh, th there have been actually a, a lot of experiments uh, along the way, uh, some of which have failed, some of which have succeeded. Where does Midori fit in all this? Well, it was definitely a different branch i think we you know we loosely based our design i mean we actually started with some of the code from singularity and eventually rewrote most of it we actually had a micro kernel so you can see some influences from mock the mock uh, kernel you can see um actually some of the early capability based operating systems uh like kikos and eros um John, jonathan shapiro's projects had a huge influence on us as well i think um because we worked at Microsoft, there was a fair bit of Windows influence, just, you know, probably more 
of a Windows influence than a Unix influence, uh, although I think the microkernel uh, was fairly unique in, in its design. Um, but because it was type and memory safe, we really had to kind of start fresh. Um, because of the lightweight isolated processes, which was very different from Windows, we had to start fresh. I do wonder, you know, today you asked what would be different today. I actually think having some level of POSIX and Unix compatibility would would be beneficial. But I think the, the trick is how to do that without compromising safety. I think a lot of the design of the POSIX APIs do depend on ambient authority, just like, you know, Win32 Win does. Um, you know, I, I'm currently on, uh, on sabbatical for a couple months, and I was actually toying with the idea of trying to rewrite a subset of the Linux kernel in Go just to see how far I would get. Um, but uh, decided that would be more than a one-month project. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> mm. um, do you think that... Um, Asynchrony is an all or nothing proposition. Um, I mean, when when you develop a, a, an application and you you start putting asynchrony in there, if you don't do it from the start, you usually you know you, you start unraveling it and it, it, you actually have to refactor everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, is it? Do you really have to to put it everywhere? Which which you obviously did with Midori, but uh, is it is it something that is universally true? Well, it's it's actually a little interesting. I think maybe I took this too far, but I I recognize a lot of kind of similarities, almost isomorphisms between things like uh, single threaded processes with blocking and asynchrony. I mean, at some point. Uh, coroutines with link stacks that can block are sort of the same thing as these, you know, uh, coroutines that are using continuation passing in the front end compiler, like await in .NET. So the question at that point is, what is the await actually giving you? It really just highlights where the blocking happens in your code, right? And so with Midori, by taking it to the extreme, you knew that nothing was ever going to block. Um, without your participation, right? Which is actually really important if you want responsive UI, for example. And we actually could, in the type system, guarantee, hey, in the UI code, nothing ever blocked. So you could stay responsive. And of course, you would have to arrange for you know some asynchrony if you wanted to do IO while the UI was trying to repaint, for example. But that's, that's practices. You're supposed to be doing that sort of thing. So if you, if you can silently introduce blocking into the code. I, I think that just leads to, everything goes to hell in a handbasket very quickly. So I, I think you do have to take it to an extreme. Um, the question is whether you take it to an extreme by something like Go, where you have Go routines and you have lots of little, you know, dependent asynchronous routines, or do you actually have to make it apparent in the type system? For the UI example, I found that you know, having it in the type system actually helped us encode best practices uh, and have the compiler help to enforce them. But it is really an architectural thing, right? You can't, as you were saying, you can't just decide, oh, I'm going to make my code asynchronous. And then, you know, you really have to think about it from the start. It leads to different design patterns. It, it really does require for, foresight and architectural planning. Yeah. Um, w one thing attracted my attention uh, in, in the blog post, which is uh, resource allocation, fork bombs, and the way you applied game theory uh, mm -hmm. to those problems. And, and you mentioned that you didn't fully solve uh, the problem here. Uh, can you uh, maybe uh, summarize what, what this is about and, and uh, the interesting solutions you found? Right. Uh, so this is what we call the resource management problem, which is funny. I think every project ends up having one of these sorts of problems where it's an unsolvable problem. And then everybody starts throwing stuff into that bucket, right? They're like, well, that's a hard problem. That's part of resource management. And the next thing you know, resource management is like unsolvable. It's huge. It contains lots of problems. Um, and so 
that, that was sort of resource management for us. Anytime we had a hard problem that had to do with resource exhaustion or something, we said, oh, we'll solve that when we get to resource management. And the reality is we, we chipped away at it. We made some progress, but not nearly to the degree I would have liked to. Um, and the real problem here is in an asynchronous system, it's actually harder. Um, in a synchronous system, if you want to stop progress, you block a thread or you suspend a thread or you just don't reschedule that thread. You know, um, In an asynchronous system, the dependencies and causality are so difficult for the system to understand. You don't know if suspending that activity over there is actually going to deadlock the system because some other guy depends on it in a different process maybe. Um, it also is difficult because you want to expose as much asynchrony to the system as possible so that it can leverage as much of the available compute cycles and schedule things efficiently. And yet, if you let it go too far, suddenly, like a fork bomb, you can just allocate tons and tons of asynchronous work, and you could exhaust the available resources in the system. So how do you know how much to express and when to back off? And so a good example is, say I'm, it's a fully async system. Say I just want to enumerate my file system. For every file on, on the disk, I want to increment a counter or something. Um, or read in you know, the number of lines. That's even worse, because now I'm going to consume a lot of memory. Well, if I just do that in the naive async way, I'm going to have, depending on the size of my file system, I'm going to have thousands, millions, perhaps, of uh, async activities in flight. So I'm going to run out of resources in the process. So somebody needs to know when to back off. And so that was, that was mostly the resource management problem, but that has deep-rooted implications in the scheduler, um, resource allocation uh, priorities, you know, like how do you, how do you know which activities you preference to, um, and how, does that flow across the system with causality? Uh, so we did, as you mentioned, we, we, we tried a lot of approaches. We tried approaches where code would declare the resource bounds that it expected to use, but that was a bad idea because developers can't really predict that. It can be dynamic. And so we really ended up choosing an adaptive approach. And there's a lot of resource our research out there using, you know, almost actually one of the guys who joined actually worked on the ad system at Microsoft. And he wanted he actually moderately successfully used an ad bidding approach for resource management. Um, if you think of CPUs on the computer is simply being, you know, resources you might want to purchase. An async activity would get a certain amount of credits, and then it could try to purchase them and bid for resources, and, and eventually the system would hand them out based on who won the bid. Um, and there are a lot of novel techniques. Uh, there's a lot of cool research. Actually, if you look at um, Sarah Bird, uh, was an intern in MSR at the time. We worked with her and Burton Smith a bit to try to use some of their approaches. but. This is definitely an interesting area of future uh, research. Uh, so you, you talked about bids, but how do you actually make the decision of who wins that bid? Well, you basically just have a finite amount of time that you're willing to make the decision in. And then at the end of that time, you award it to the highest bidder. Highest bidder? What does it mean? I mean, it's not money, right? <laughs> there has to be something that they uh, that they put into the the bucket. And uh, what right. is it? You think of it as virtual currency, you know. And, and this is really just priorities, right? You you can model this as giving every every uh, async activity in the system a priority, and then every time it uses a time slice, does it does, uh, uh, does it have that. a budget that it can decide to spend on this or that or? Right. So it, it gets complicated. Um, there are some cool papers out there about this sort of approach. Um, but as I said, this, this was an open, so I, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this, because this was just one of the many ideas we tried. Um, okay. But the good news is, I make it sound like maybe it was disastrous, but it wasn't disastrous. In general, the system worked very well. I, I don't think it sounds like that, actually. Uh, you, you see, I was very curious about hearing the right. details about that. It's, it, it's, very, yeah, it's very interesting. And really pragmatic approaches worked, too. And 
you know, for example, in a thread pool, for example, in a synchronous system, the thread pool kind of decides how many concurrent activities to keep going at once. Mm. Uh, so it's, I always thought of that as like a vertical uh, concurrency. Like it's, it decides, you know, how many stovepipes to have going at, at any given time. In our system, it was smeared throughout the, the entire system because of, you know, cross-process message passing and all that. So it was more of a, I always thought of it as more of a horizontal decision rather than being this vertical stovepipe model. The reality is that one of the more um, pragmatic approaches was just having the developer write um, what we call wide loops, which is essentially saying, hey, I'm just going to launch 32 activities at once. Mm and just keep 32 in flight at any given time. And if it drops to 31, schedule another one and just keep going until I'm done. And that's very, and if you look at today's systems, that's essentially what most people do. So that was a very effective technique. And didn't require nearly as much rocket science as all these other things that I was talking about. Hard problem. Yes, the mythical resource management problem. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can you talk about mutable statics? Because that uh, you're saying in your article that this was a really deep decision to make to to, to uh, prohibit those, uh, and uh, I thought that was really interesting. Personally, I hate static variables. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I get yelled at by by people when I mention that sometimes, but. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so part of the capability thing was when I say ambient authority, I mean any ambient authority. And statics were actually just a special case of ambient authority where um, I can stick an object in a static variable and then without actually passing it around, some random code can access that static variable by name and do something with it. Um, and so we ban static variables, I mean, it's, uh, and also from a, just a safety standpoint, you know, we didn't, we did have parallelism within a process. Uh, that's a whole another topic, how we did that safely. Um, but for safe concurrency, also, you don't want mutable statics. And so we had in the type system, in the language, we had the notion of immutability very deep throughout the system. Uh, you could declare an immutable class. You could declare that one particular instance of a class was immutable. So one object was immutable. You could, you could actually dynamically build up an object and then freeze it and know that its entire transit of closure of state was immutable. Uh, and we had this in the language. That's actually one of the blog posts I'm working on now that should go up in a couple weeks about how we did that. Uh, so what we said is all static variables were immutable. So you could have constants. You could have lookup tables. You could have any object actually, but the key thing in our system is, um, oh, and another thing I should mention is the extreme cost of mutable statics. I don't think people realize, I blogged about this in one of my posts on the code quality. It was incredible to me when I found out how much code is actually generated to do lazy initialization checks of static variables in C sharp programs. I mean, I knew the semantic, I knew it was lazy initialized, but in practice, it's actually very bad. There's a lot of checks. There's, um, depending on, you know, which the C sharp compiler will pick whether it's this more precise initialization or relaxed initialization. Um, so it's costly too. So instead of doing that, which you don't have this cost in C++ and C programs, which again, remember we were trying to compete with C level, C like performance. So we actually went to this model where everything had to be immutable. And then we actually evaluated static initializers at compile time. And then we would take the objects and we'd actually freeze them into the resulting native binary. And so actually, depending on whether it was a DLL or a static link library, the best case was accessing a static variable, no dynamic checks, nothing like that. It was literally a constant address in the data segment of the binary. And so it was incredibly efficient as well. We called these frozen objects. Mm -hmm. Now, it was controversial. Um, if you want, Ask Jared Parsons about it someday. He would, he would lose faith every couple of weeks and come into my office and, and say, Joe, we need to add mutable statics to the system. And I said, hell no. 
and I stuck with it. But it, it was painful. When you ported existing code, it was amazing how much code in the world depends on, on mutable statics. But I think it was an important decision, and I'm glad that we stuck with it. Is there a way uh, developers can? I mean, does it does it have to be baked into the language that decision that 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 statics are expensive, static variables are expensive, or is it is it something that you can get some of the benefits by actually uh, uh, architecting your application to not use them? Or well, you can definitely get a lot of the benefits of the you know the safety and the predictability and reliability and understandability. Um, you can't really, you know, the performance benefits are hard because the runtime system would need to know that these certain statics are immutable and, and it, then it could elide some of the checking or something. That's one of the features we've talked about potentially adding in the future uh, because some, some statics are actually frozen in .NET today. For example, if you do an NGEN, a lot of the strings end up frozen, frozen in, the, in the image. So, you, you could, in principle, start adding this in a few select places for objects you know that you know are actually immutable. And there's a bunch of GitHub issues. We're actually talking a lot about how to add immutability into C Sharp. Uh, again, it's tough to retrofit this sort of thing. I actually think an immutable class uh, or an immutable struct is actually something that's reasonably easy to retrofit and add back into the system. The question yeah, is... And, and there is the, the record feature that, that that's right. is being discussed. So. Yeah. Right. So I think we'll get some of the benefits. Uh, and then once once you have it in a language like that in the type system, you can actually leverage it to do novel optimizations and runtime uh, optimizations like the ones I mentioned. Mm. Uh, another question from Julien. Aside from static ambient APIs and then safe code, are there part of .NET which you found are not compatible with capability discipline? It's really, well, so here's a good example of how deep-rooted this issue is. It really impacts your API design significantly when you have this, this capability model. Uh, for example, we didn't want to eliminate all ambient um, not just ambient authority, but also ambient non-determinism. Um, and this, all these things build on top of each other. So for example, if you can get the current time through a static function, for example, if you can say date time dot now and statically retrieve the current time, you now have non-determinism in the system. So it, when it comes to freezing objects, now there's non-determinism. And so you don't know that function calls are purely functional. In the system that we had, we, we can actually look at all the inputs to a function and know that if all the inputs to the function are immutable, the thing coming that it returns is itself immutable if you want it to be. So we would be able to memoize return values in the compiler. We could actually freeze things. Once you allow one thing into the system that violates that principle, you can no longer kind of make that, that stronger guarantee. But if you think about that, think about if you couldn't say date time dot now, what would you do? So in our system, you had a capability and it was called the clock. So you'd get this thing, its type was clock, you pass it around, you configure it, uh, subsystems. And so like, of course you don't wanna pass a clock object every time you call your logging API, for example. But when you construct your logger, maybe it's okay it's, again, kind of this dependency injection sort of thing. Maybe it's okay at construction time, you configure the thing with the clock that it's meant to use, and that's your opportunity to change it to the right time zone and all those, those sorts of patterns. But it really fundamentally changes the way you build APIs. Yeah, do you think, do you think there are way too many static APIs in .NET? What about the file system, for example? Should we refactor the file system API in .NET? I'm not sure. So again, this gets back to the thing I was talking about earlier. I think we were going for a really extreme level of self-consistency, extreme level of kind of reliability and, and performance. And I think we did some things that compromised usability. That was one of the things that the, you know, as we look to bring some lessons learned back to C sharp, it really forced us to look at a lot of these things under, under light. And I'm not, I think we might have gone too far in some places. You know, I think if you took away date time dot now, 
Uh, it, it was definitely an interesting system. And I think if the whole system was built that way, it was definitely a worthwhile step to take. But I think adding that back to an existing system is, is so difficult to do. I think final system though, I think that it led to better APIs actually doing it the way we did. So that, that is an example of one where I think you could retrofit it and it would actually work out quite well. Do you think it would be that annoying to be to 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 have to inject a clock to use time in your application, or is it, or do the uh, benefits actually uh, make it make, make it tolerable? So I personally liked it, but I'm weird, uh, and I think the benefits were definitely worth it but only when you had the whole system that was working together in harmony to take advantage mm. of something, right? So like, if you didn't have immutable objects, would you still want to do this? If you didn't have capability security everywhere, wouldn't it be annoying if now you have to pass a clock around, but you can go and, you know, say open file and just pass a random string as the path and get access to the, the file. I mean, having that lack of consistency, I think would make it maybe unbearable for for a lot of programmers, especially, and this is one thing I've struggled with as I look at bringing some of the Midori lessons is C Sharp occupies this interesting spectrum between systems and dynamic languages. And it, it appeals to both audiences for different reasons. And I think probably it appeals more to the dynamic and more kind of rapid application development audience. And so I think if you start doing some of these things too radically, you actually start to lose maybe the bread and butter, kind of the, the, the key audience that's keeping .NET kind of vibrant and alive, right? Mm. So that, that would probably be a bad idea. And so that's one of the things we struggle with when we look at how to bring some of these lessons you know, to the real world. Yeah, on the other hand, for, for that particular uh, issue, uh, I I'm, I'm not so sure because it seems like uh, .NET developers are more and more warming up to the idea of dependency injection. So those ideas are, the, the idea of injecting your dependencies into your constructor, it's something that, that really resonates with lots of people. So right. how far are we then from, from making those ideas entirely tolerable and uh, uh, maybe, maybe some older APIs that, that have a lot of static methods uh, could actually be refactored into something that is more in tune with, with those ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I think we're kind of partway through a journey of trying to figure out where .NET goes next. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, I think a lot of these ideas are still in the running and it's just a matter of you know, figuring out the details, which is probably the hardest part. <laughs> Uh, we're almost out of time. Um, do you have uh, any recommendations for uh, people who want to learn new languages, for example? Uh, you've, you've talked about Trust and Go. Um, my, I guess my question is, uh, what is the exciting stuff going on today, in your opinion? I try to write code in six or seven languages regularly, try to try to change it up a little bit just to stay on top of what's going on. I think uh, I've been writing a lot of uh, JavaScript, ECMAScript sticks um, over the past couple of months. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there with, especially with modules. I think now JavaScript finally has a nice module system. And if you wanna, if you wanna get a taste of it, you can use TypeScript. TypeScript actually is tracking pretty closely to where we expect ES6 to be. Um, when all when the dust settles, um, and I think you know, coupled with a weight, some of the interface features, you know, some of the more esoteric features like union types, it, it's actually a very powerful type system that allows you to kind of duct type the world and 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 be more productive. Uh, so that that's pretty exciting. It's fun. I think Go for me. Uh, I I wish there were you know a few things done differently. Uh, I think. But it, Go is very exciting for me. I think uh, it's just a pleasure to, to write code in Go for me. It's it's so much simpler than most other languages. I think I, for the nice things I just said about JavaScript, the one negative I would say is it's getting incredibly complicated, um, far too much. I think Go really, 
nailed it with trying to stay simple. Yeah, uh, on the on the plus side, I would say that uh, the new versions of JavaScript are fixing the right things. They are. I, I, I have I have some uh, code bases that I manage in JavaScript, and I'm very excited to refactor all that to use the new features because my code is going to become so much simpler, actually. Yeah. But but yeah, the language is is becoming more complicated. It used to be very sparse and uh, low on concept count. Uh, yeah, I think most most mature languages hit this point. I mean, arguably C sharp is at this at this level, which it make, makes it really difficult for us to figure out which you know features to add to the language because we don't want to make it too complicated. Um, you still need to be able to you know we need to think about people who are learning the language from scratch, right? I think C plus plus. There's some exciting things going on there. I think C++ is another example. You know, it's it's we need to be very careful what we what we add, and of course we have a whole committee to you know, the ISO committee to figure that out. But um, it's it's exciting. There's a lot of radical thinking and radical ideas, which which is good to good to see. Um, not sure you know which ones will make it in, but um, some of the safe C++ work that we've been doing with Bjarne Strustrup has has been exciting. Um, Turns out you can use C++ in a, you know, a certain set of guidelines and, and actually have a moderate level of type and memory safety these days with you know smart pointers and that sort of thing. So that's pretty exciting. I think Rust is fantastic. Um, I think uh, it, they basically worked on a lot of similar ideas to us, kind of almost independently. We didn't really you know attention to each other until we got to a certain stage and I think interestingly we ended up tackling a lot of the, the same problems like concurrency safety efficiency you know their memory system with barred pointers and everything is super interesting um, yeah so it's, I mean there's a lot of fun language work going on right now I would encourage people to just you know in terms of how to learn just pick a language write a project um, it's it's actually Pretty pretty easy. A lot of a lot of these languages nowadays, we're kind of bottom bottoming out on the same set of fundamental concepts. Like everybody's got modules, everybody's got interfaces. Um, so that's nice. Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much for being on the show. This was tons of fun. Um, very very interesting and again I, I encourage everybody to read the blog post about about midori um thanks again uh, next week we'll have uh, scott hanselman on the show great thanks so much all right take care you too bye bye, -bye.